Hi, good evening, and welcome to Worse, stories of strength and endurance from the old days. Times are tough, but we'll get through this. We've been through worse. Uh, tonight, we will be looking at Beyond Krakatoa, Nigeria's fight against polio, and the building of the Golden Gate Bridge. So grab something to eat and drink while we talk. Uh, I will be having a Old Rock Cider made with apples from Virginia, North Carolina. Uh, I don't get any endorsement for these things. I'm just letting you know what I'm having. And I'm going to have a few pickles with it. So if you want to have something to eat, you can stop the video, grab something to eat and drink, get started. Our first story is about the famous volcano of Krakatoa. But before we get there, I want to do a follow-up on an episode of Wars from just before Christmas of 2020, which was called Trapped in the Snow for Christmas. I told the story of people surviving in the wilderness, a woman trapped when her car slid off the road in a national forest, who was trapped there for days, finally evacuated, taken to a hospital, grateful to be alive, etc. Well, on February 5th of this year, the New York Times reported about a 77-year-old woman who survived days trapped in a van after a snowstorm. Uh, Janet Ward was trapped for four days after the recent heavy snow that fell in the Northeast. She survived on food and water, which thank God she had in the van. And she had in fact called 911, but authorities struggled to pinpoint her location. But here's the twist. This happened in Newark, the most populous state, the most populous city in the most populous state in the country. And she was parked at the curb. She got plowed in. She was plowed in at the curb and was trapped there for about four days. She had called 911. The operator took down her address wrong. And then when they called her back, she didn't answer. So they couldn't find her. They just knew there was somebody trapped in a van somewhere in Newark. She said that occasionally people would walk by. She would honk, but they misinterpreted her honking and they just kept walking. So finally, she called 911 back and they shoveled her out. They brought her some food from a local soup kitchen. And then she drove off to the drugstore to pick up her medication. I'm glad you made it out, Ms. Ward. All right. Indonesia has the most active volcanoes of any country in the world, about 130. Uh, in 1883, one of its volcanoes, Krakatoa, which had been dormant for about 200 years, began to show some activity. In May, uh, a German warship passing it reported that it had smoke coming out of the top of it. Uh, at one point in May, an explosion emanated from the volcano that was heard 100 miles away, but then it died down again. On June 19th, eruptions resumed. And then on August 26th and 27th, there were several catastrophic explosions, one of which was heard 2,200 miles away in Perth, Australia. Atmospheric shock waves registered on instruments literally on the other side of the earth. 18 to 20, they estimate, cubic miles of material was ejected from the volcano as the magma chamber under the volcano uh, evacuated all of its contents. So Krakatoa was located on an island in the Sundan Strait, which is an opening between two bodies of water in Indonesia that run, it runs roughly east to west. So to the north and south, there are two peninsulas that come down, which is what makes it a strait. Uh, unfortunately, these, these peninsulas have bays that narrow to points in both directions. This turned out to be a very, very bad thing. Uh, at that time, the, Indonesia was a Dutch colony. And so the Dutch are the authorities that reported on the results of it. And they said that about 36,000 people were killed. Uh, a relatively small number of them were killed in the actual eruption. I think the island on which Krakatoa was located was not uh, regarded as an inhabited island. But tsunamis, tidal waves, resulted, which were up to 120 feet high, amplified by these bays that narrowed to a point. So, uh, at first, it was thought that much of the material that was produced by this eruption was the old volcanic cone blown into the air because it had been 2,667 feet high. And after Krakatoa 
erupted isn't even the right word, exploded, uh, it, it, it was almost at sea level. But later analysis revealed that the material distributed in the area was, new, was, from, was new magma from the chamber deep beneath, and that after that chamber emptied itself, the old volcano just collapsed into the resulting hole. Only about 10% of the, of the material released was the, uh, the old volcano. So as the magma erupted up from places where it was under deeper pressure, it expanded, it distended into pumice. I don't know if you've ever seen pumice stone, which is a, a relatively lightweight stone because it has so many air pockets in it, um, was what was produced. And those air spaces are so big that it's a stone that actually floats. There were places where it was floating 10 feet thick on the surface of the ocean. People reported that it looked like solid land. Uh, it inhibited the passage of ships. So the island on which Krakatoa had been located was called Rakata Island. It was almost gone afterwards. Um, but the effects went so far beyond Indonesia because much of what was ejected wasn't just, didn't come down as pumice rocks. It was fine particulate matter that went into the air. It was gases released. Um, this cooled off the atmosphere for about a year. Uh, global temperatures were somewhere between 1.3 degrees and 3 degrees lower the following year. And sunsets were tinted reddish, orange, um, pinkish in ways they hadn't been before. Uh, people reported brilliant sunsets all around the earth afterwards. This affected what we see sometimes in art that was painted at the time. Uh, there's a famous picture of the scream. You've probably seen it. It's made its way onto mouse pads and memes on the computer by an artist named Edvard Munch. He painted in the year right after Krakatoa. And the sky behind his figure is a, a kind of a brilliant reddish orange. They think that's because of Krakatoa. So uh, on the peninsula that uh, closed off the southern part of the Sundan Strait, where Krakatoa had been located, um, had itself a small peninsula called Ujong Kulon. That is now a national park in Indonesia. One source that I read is that that park was established so that that peninsula would not be re-inhabited because those pe people would be at extremely high risk, not if, but when that volcano exploded again. So from uh, its original remnants after the explosion, which were almost at sea level, a new volcano, which they call Anak Krakatau, which means child of Krakatoa, uh, has begun to be rebuilt by volcanic activity, and it's now about 600 feet high. One of the reasons that we've heard so much about Krakatoa, in, in addition to its severity, is that it happened at a time when news could spread around the world relatively easily. It was the age of um, the telegraph. It was an age of photography. It was an age of steamships. But as I said, Indonesia has about 130 active volcanoes. And there was an eruption decades earlier in 1815 from a volcano called Tambora that was much, much worse. The immediate results were 100,000 people dead um, in the vicinity of Tambora. And most of those died of starvation because what came out of the volcano killed crops, contaminated groundwater, Etc. But so much material was ejected by this explosion that it reduced sunlight levels all around the earth. It changed weather patterns. It reduced rainfall in some areas. It led to several years of crop failures all over the world and maybe a million deaths from starvation. The explosion was 10 times more powerful than Krakatoa. The mountain was 13,000 feet tall. Now it's about 4,000 feet tall. Uh, the US um, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration reports that it was the largest eruption ever recorded. Smithsonian.com says it was the largest eruption in the last 10,000 years. In 1816, the year that it, uh, was that the year after it erupted? Do, 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 do. Um, it was either the year it erupted or the year after it erupted. Um, People in the northeastern U.S. and in Europe called it the year without a summer. Uh, some people called it the year that went backward. 
It came out of the winter into the spring of 1816, and then everything cooled off. And in July, there were frosts in some parts of the northeastern United States. Uh, they think that this explosion of Tambora is the reason why, because the matter ejected from it reduced the sunlight reaching the surface of the Earth so much. Um, this probably accelerated population loss in New England and increased settlement in Ohio and Indiana. Farmers in the Northeast, in New England, uh, that were perhaps on the fence about relocating to the new territories opening up to the West as the United States expanded, had their minds made up by the year without a summer. Uh, other New Englanders called it uh, the year 1800 and froze to death. In Germany, they called 1817 the year of the beggar because there were so many crop failures that people were going hungry, people were starving. And then there's an interesting story in a couple of sources, including the New York Times, that says that in that year, there were several English literary figures vacationing in Switzerland. Um, and though it was the summer, they didn't have the experience they, they, they expected. First of all, Switzerland, that is usually a relatively prosperous country, was oppressed by starvation. Um, and these people were driven inside by the cold. So uh, one day to amuse themselves around the fire, they decided to tell ghost stories. One of those writers was Lord Byron, the famous Lord Byron, who, and this is related by a third party later, and you can read it online at, Guten, at the uh, gutenberg.org Gutenberg project. He wrote a story, story called The Vampire. Now this was years before the novel Dracula was written by Bram Stoker, but Lord Byron being a famous and celebrated writer at that time may have put the idea of a vampire into the public consciousness. One of the other people at this gathering who decided to put her mind to the task of amusing people with a scary story was a Miss M.W. Godwin, Mary W. Godwin, who later married another attendee at this gathering around the fire in Switzerland named Percy Bysshe Shelley. She became Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein. So we might not have Dracula and Frankenstein monsters as a uh, part of our popular imagination, our popular culture, if it wasn't for the explosion of Tambora in 1816. Ice cores to this day from Greenland and Antarctica have unusually high sulfur content in their 1815-1816 band. So I want to thank uh, Britannica.com, History.com, Smithsonian.org, and New York Times for information leading to this story. Hey, when I was a kid, uh, I met an older guy in a church in Queens, New York, who was crippled from polio. Now, he's the only person I have ever met personally who I know was a victim of this horrible disease. But in American history, the most famous victim is Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Now, his case was atypical. Polio at that time, when he got it, was known as infantile paralysis. It was relatively rare for adults to get it, but FDR contracted it at the age of 39. Now, three quarters of the people infected with the polio virus get no symptoms. Uh, about one quarter have flu-like symptoms. And in the case of about one in 100, it attacks the nerves in their spinal cord, leading to nerve death and permanent paralysis. People who can't walk anymore. Uh, in more extreme cases, people who can't even operate the muscles to breathe anymore. Now, miraculous advances were made in the 1950s when the when uh, the Salk vaccine was developed, which was a shot, and Sabin vaccine in the 1960s, which was an oral medication. In pretty short order, these two medications eliminated polio in U.S. in the U.S. and in most of the world. Um, now, there are two different forms. Um, there is wild polio virus, that is the kind that uh, one person would transmit to another in an area where people haven't, where the disease hasn't been eradicated. And then there's vaccine-derived polio virus, which is relatively rare. Um, but that comes from the fact that the oral polio vaccine, uh, which was used less in the U.S. and a lot more in other, in other parts of the world, uh, can mutate inside of a person's body and basically become an active form of polio again. But as I said, it's rare. So as of 2010, uh, only three countries in the world still had wild polio virus infections, Nigeria, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. Now, I, Nigeria had made big progress. They are the most populous country in Africa, uh, about 200 million people as of 2020. 
their population is approximately evenly split between Christians and Muslims with a relatively small percentage of the population practicing indigenous religions. And the reason I bring that up is that conflict has arisen between the Christian and Muslim portions of the population. So in 2003, when Nigeria already had polio eradication efforts underway, misinformation spread among the uh, Muslim population, a false claim that the vaccine was contaminated with drugs by the U.S. to make Muslim women infertile. To make this bad problem, this misinformation issue even worse, uh, in the northern parts of the country where Muslims are more prevalent, uh, a rebel group called Boko Haram began to wage war against the government, um, declared some parts of the country independent, their influence spread into other neighboring countries, and they were an, uh, an organization similar to ISIS. They wanted to establish a, uh, um, a government based on Sharia law, which was the ancient Muslim law. And in fact, Boko Haram means something like Western education is evil. So you can imagine how receptive they were to the idea of a polio eradication program. So uh, the bar was set pretty high for the people in Nigeria trying to eradicate this disease. It proceeded by the work of scientists, Nigerian scientists who did lab tests that dismissed the false rumor about the infertility chemicals in the vaccine. Health workers, 95% uh, of whom were women, risking their lives in dangerous regions of the country, not only to administer vaccine, but to persuade local political and religious leaders to support their effort. And, and I think this is very inspiring, survivors of polio infections. Now, remember that it can render somebody paralyzed in the, in the space of just a few days. That's what happened to FDR, who was rich and had access to the best care in the world at, at that time. But here is um, something that uh, the president of the Nigerian Polio Survivors Association, who is Mizbahu Loandidi, said. He said that it, when they go into these villages, um, many have rejected the polio vaccine but they see how much we struggle to reach them, sometimes crawling large distances. To speak to them, we ask them, don't you think it's important for you to protect your child, not to be like us? As of 2013, progress had continued to be made, but there were setbacks that year. Reuters, uh, the uh, news wire service reported, gunmen killed nine polio health workers in Nigeria. Gunmen on bikes opened fire on a health center that was administering the polio vaccine. And they, uh, though Boko Haram didn't claim responsibility for this, they believe it was related because the previous month in Pakistan, one of the other three countries that still had wild strains of the virus, uh, Islamist militant gunmen killed aid workers administering the vaccine, administering polio vaccine. Also because of the false belief that the vaccine represented an effort to make women infertile. Nevertheless, efforts continued, and in 2015, the World Health Organization said that Nigeria had been polio-free for one year. Now, apparently, the gold standard of this measurement is that a country goes three years without any wild polio virus infections. Unfortunately, in 2016, uh, cases broke out again in the area controlled by this militant group, Boko Haram. But the efforts continued. Um, <clears throat> the Nigerian government began to train members of its military to administer vaccines. The military trained volunteers who, <laughs> this is what they were called in a story on NBC News, um, vigilantes. It's the only time I've ever heard that term used in a positive way. Uh, they trained vigilantes who were armed to go to places where Boko Haram was in control and administer the polio vaccine. Um, some of the uh, efforts made in 2018, when they were getting close to success, were sponsored by the World Health Organization and by Rotary International. Way to go, Rotary, um, to get the vaccine everywhere in the country. Um, one of the things that a, a Rotary volunteer reported in an interview was that she would tell moms that their kids would never forgive them if they ended up paralyzed. <laughs> they, uh, she found that to be an effective sales technique. So in 2019, there were still 66,000 kids not vaccinated in a northern state uh, named Borno, the state of Borno in Nigeria. Uh, so polio vaccine was still circling because 
it can break out rapidly and spread rapidly among people who haven't been immunized. But on August 25th of 2020, uh, the World Health Organization announced that Nigeria, and for that reason, all of Africa, was free of wild polio virus. So from a generation earlier, when tens of thousands of children were paralyzed every year, they got to no wild cases and almost no cases at all. And this was done by many brave women and men working in conditions of danger. They freed their continent from polio. I think it underscores the idea that it's always been hard to move the world forward. And I tell myself this sometimes when I get discouraged, especially when I get discouraged doing something that's difficult. So in 2004, I saw a show on PBS. They did a series called The American Experience, which I, I loved, I recommend. It might still be on for all I know. That said that during the Depression in the United States, when a big project was undertaken, um, a big construction project, the assumption was that for every million dollars of budget of that project, one worker would die. When the decision was finally moved forward to build the Golden Gate Bridge, the estimated cost was $35 million. So it's not hard to do the math on what the expectations were in terms of the mortality. Uh, it was begun in 1933. Now, that was a pretty tough time in the United States. Um, at the groundbreaking, a congratulatory telegram was received from President Herbert Hoover. And I want to remind you that he is the president um, who had just been defeated by Franklin Roosevelt, who was about to take office, um, after whom Hoovervilles were named. That was the, the Depression-era term for shanty towns, uh, people living in tents, living in uh, shelters thrown together from scrap lumber and pieces of tin roofing because they had nowhere else to go. That's a, a little bit of his legacy, deserved or undeserved. But uh, this project was begun in this difficult time. And some of the things, some of the obstacles they had to overcome are really impressive. When I just remember that communication was so much more difficult then. I mean, they had, they had phones, they had telegrams, but this was before the internet. Uh, this was before satellites. Some of the materials for the building of the Golden Gate Bridge, the steel that had to be built to precise dimensions and precise strengths, um, was built, was uh, fabricated by Bethlehem Steel in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, put on railroad cars and taken to Philadelphia, put on a ship, and transported by ship through the Panama Canal up the West Coast to San Francisco, where the bridge was being built. And once they overcame practical obstacles like that, which they knew from the outset were going to happen, there were unforeseen things that happened. For example, um, there were... Uh, the, Gold, the Golden Gate Bridge spans the strait that is between San Francisco in the south and Marin County in the north. And so each of these, uh, the suspension bridge that the Golden Brigade Bridge is, was supported by two towers. They called it the San Francisco Tower and the Marin Tower. So to work on the San Francisco Tower, they built an access trestle, like a temporary bridge that workers and materials could be brought across. It was um, 1,100 feet long. Landing from the, you know, so that every morning the workers could come from the mainland onto the, uh, the tower where, that they were constructing. But this temporary bridge, this trestle got knocked down twice. First, it was hit by a steamship in the fog, and there was fog about 70% of the time <laughs> while they were building the bridge. Uh, another time, an 800-foot section of this was uh, knocked down by a two-day storm. So they had to rebuild the temporary bridge before they could even get back to work building the real bridge. Um, in addition to dealing with things like fog, winds could gust to 60 miles an hour, especially as the bridge got up higher. And let's not forget an, another obstacle that we can all be thankful we will probably not have to encounter in our lives, lead paint. Now, if you're my age, lead paint was a boogeyman of your childhood that where you would see commercials on television encouraging parents don't let your children eat paint chips in their house because until fairly recently, it had been legal to use lead paint in houses. That, that practice ended in my childhood, but it was still legal for a very long time to put lead paint on bridges, dams, and ships. And at any rate, the construction of the Golden Gate Bridge happened long before any of those rules were passed. And what they found was that when a bridge is being put together with rivets, which are um, 
uh, things that imagine they, they look like a nail or a screw, but very thick. They are heated to be red hot. They were put through pre-existing holes in two pieces of steel. And then the sides of them were uh, hammered while that steel was still red hot and soft into a shape that would hold firmly and would hold those two pieces of steel together. But the problem was that this all of this steel had been primed or painted or both to protect it from the fog, from the salt air, from all the things that would want to corrode it uh, with lead paint. So when this red hot steel was applied to it, the paint would vaporize and there was a, a significant damage to workers' health by having to breathe in lead paint vapor. So uh, to his enormous credit, the chief engineer on the project, Joseph Strauss, uh, did something that had not been done previously. He mandated respirators for the riveters so they wouldn't be inhaling vaporized lead all day long while they were riveting the bridge together. But I have to, but you know, I can't help but reflect that still the people actually applying the primer and the paint to all these surfaces, no doubt they were getting it on their hands, their feet, their arms. There, there are other things that made the conditions adverse. I'm remembering a quote by Mark Twain who said, the coldest winter I ever spent was a summer in San Francisco. And these guys were working, you know, at various points, hundreds of feet in the air. There was about 200 feet, there's about 200 feet of clearance under the bridge so that big ships can get under. So these guys who were building this were way up high. So over the course of the construction, this $35 million project, 30 workers did fall, did fall, but 19 of them lived because Chief Engineer Strauss had a net strung beneath the bridge. It cost about $130,000 in dollars of those times. So it would have been, it'd be much, much more now, but it turned out to be a very worthwhile investment if you care about the health of your workers, which he clearly did. Uh, those 19 men who fell and were saved by the net called themselves the halfway to hell club. But one of the things that this uh, PBS special had reported was that because times were so tough and this was a depression, there were people lined up all the time hoping that a job would open. And they were lined up within view of the bridge. They were watching the work happen on the bridge. So the guys who were working on the bridge could not help but think, those guys are down there hoping one of us falls because then he'll have a job. But the fact is, they got almost to the end of construction. They got into early 1937 and only one person had died. And then a very, very bad thing happened where a five ton platform that was attached to a certain part of the bridge while it was being constructed broke loose, fell, ripped through the net, and 10 men died right when they were almost done. I, I, in addition to the tragedy of the loss and the pain suffered by their families, I'm just trying to imagine how discouraging that must have been. But uh, the Golden Gate Bridge Highway and Transportation District website lists those 11 men who died by name, and their names are also on a plaque at the bridge. So their, their memory is uh, preserved and respected. But you know, when I, when I look back on all the obstacles they suffered, I think one of the most discouraging details, and this comes from a website I'm not real familiar with called HowStuffWorks.com. I'd like to know if it's a reliable source or not, I can't verify, is that when they started to get serious about building this bridge in the 1920s and they held public hearings, the ferry companies that prior to the existence of the bridge made their money ferrying people between San Francisco and Marin County realized that they were gonna lose business. So they began an anti-bridge campaign that stopped construction for eight years. Self-interest, fear. It's amazing to me that anything gets done in this country sometimes. Nevertheless, on May 29th, 1937, uh, the bridge opened. It was the longest suspension bridge in the world. And that reminds me of the construction of the Empire State Building, which had been finished about six years previously. You know, it's as if people said, hey, you know, it's the worst depression in the country's history. How do we help people survive? Hey, you know what? Survival is not enough of a goal. Let's do something big. And I would say in the case of the Golden Gate Bridge, that at this point, two billion vehicles have driven across it, that we can imp get be impressed that those people working high above rocks and churning water in high winds, fog, pounding red hot rivets into steel beams with the lead paint sizzling off them, that they accomplished what they set out to do. 
So I want to thank uh, Smithsonian Channel on YouTube, history.com, goldengate.org, howstuffworks.com. And if you've enjoyed this, please like and subscribe below. Um, consider uh, visiting us on our uh, Facebook page, which is uh, free to join, James Michael Riley Studios. And there you can find information on supporting us on Patreon for, for as little as $3 a month. You can help us keep this content coming week after week, five days a week. Thanks very much. I've enjoyed talking to you. This is worse. We'll get through this. We've been through worse.